Um, so welcome everybody to the second of three sessions in our series on editing and encoding in the undergraduate classroom organized jointly by the SUNY Geneseo Center for Digital Learning, the New York Digital Humanities Group and Digital Thorough. I'm Paul Schacht, professor of English at SUNY Geneseo, director of the Geneseo CDL and director of Digital Thorough. If you missed the first session last week in which Professor David Birnbaum presented the series keynote on designing and implementing digital editions. You can find a recording of it on the series website. The address is near the bottom of the slide right in front of you. So just uh, look for the link on the website to recordings. Um, even if you were able to attend, you wanna rewatch it, um, you, could, you can find it there. Uh, and uh, uh, as you already know, we're recording tonight's session as well. Um, in tonight's session, the group that's been working for over a year with the newly digitized manuscript of Walden, funded by a SUNY Innovative Instruction Technology Grant, will talk about editing and encoding with the Walden manuscript. I gave a shout out to all these folks at last week's session, so I won't read through their names and affiliations again tonight, but here they are. One th thing worth noting about them is that many of them, including me, teach at public public liberal arts institutions with a focus on undergraduate instruction. I do insist though on giving a second shout out to Dr. Beth Witherell, editor-in-chief editor of the writings of Henry D. Thoreau, whose incredibly generous donation of her time to the project was absolutely instrumental in our ability to secure grant funding and without whose deep expertise on Thoreau's manuscripts, we wouldn't have been able to do anything, I guarantee you. I also want to acknowledge the Huntington Library in California, whose willingness to share the digitized manuscript of Walden openly with the public under a Creative Commons license is a huge boon to teachers, scholars, and anyone who takes an interest in American literature or history. Our work over the past year has fallen into two parts broadly. One part has been to build a set of open access instructional modules that anyone can use to teach or learn independently about the practice of digital scholarly editing. These modules are still under construction. Note the advisory on the website you're looking at here. But as you can see from the contents so far, uh, the modules aim to place digital scholarly editing in the larger context of scholarly editing as a whole, and even in the context of editing more broadly. One thing the modules could do, we hope, is to make it easier for faculty teaching students about text encoding to give the assignment that the kind of assignment that one member of our group, group Rebecca Nesbitt at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, will talk about later in the session. The modules use examples from the Walden manuscript to illustrate some of the very matters that David Birnbaum described so clearly last week. The second part of what we've been doing has been to develop and implement a plan for encoding the newly digitized Walden manuscript in TEI. This work too is still under construction and later if there's time we can tell you more about it. But our focus tonight is on the manuscript as a kind of laboratory you can have students work in if they're going to try to understand and practice encoding. And to get us started with that, Beth Witherell is going to give us a brief introduction to the Walden Manuscript and its history. Okay, thank you, Paul. And I wanna say that um, I've enjoyed every minute of our collaboration. It's just been a blast. So thank you for inviting me to do this. So let's go on to the first slide. I hope some of the information that, or the next slide, I hope some of the information that I give you tonight will help if you wanna get into the Walden Manuscript yourself after this. So this is the Huntington Library's landing page for the high resolution digital image of the Walden Manuscript. The Walden Manuscript comprises much of what survives from Thoreau's years long project of writing the book. He moved to the pond on July 4th, 1845. In fall 1846, he started writing a lecture about his life there. On September 6, 1847, he left the pond and over the next seven years, he worked on the book in six more stints, not including making the fair copy for the printer. Tickner and Fields published Walden on August 9, 1854. 
you'll see that the manuscript is divided into seven drafts underneath the browse button you see those a through g there's also a group of leaves called additional material the huntington owns the corrected proof sheets of walden too and those are also accessible from this landing page down at the bottom corrected proof next slide please there are a few important and not obvious things to know about the manuscript. None of the drafts is a complete version of Walden. None of the drafts is completely continuous. Some contain longer consecutive sections than others. The current order of leaves in the manuscript is not the order in which Thoreau left them. The ownership history, which I'll cover in the next slide, helps to explain that. HM 924 does not contain all of the manuscripts connected with composing Walden. Thoreau composed some Walden material in his journal and about 50 leaves with Walden content were sold separately from the 924 group. They're now in private collections and libraries. And as I mentioned, the final fair copy that Thoreau sent to the printer is not extant. Next slide, please. The order of leaves in the Walden manuscript probably remained close to Thoreau's, whatever that was, until the dealer George Hellman bought it with other Thoreau manuscripts from E.H. Russell in 1904. After that, there were two major rearrangements. William Bixby acquired the Walden manuscript along with hundreds of other Thoreau manuscripts in 1905. He hired Frank Sanborn to examine, identify, and transcribe these manuscripts. Sanborn went through the leaves of the Walden manuscript and numbered them to indicate the location of their contents in an 1889 reprint of Walden. Then Sanborn ordered the manuscript leaves according to the page numbers he had written on them. All the leaves with page one content followed by all the leaves with page two content and then all the leaves with page three content and so on. We'll see some of Sanborn's numbers in a minute. In 1918, when Henry Huntington purchased the Walden manuscript, it was in the order Sanborn had imposed. It remained in that order until the 1950s when Thoreau scholar J. Lyndon Shanley rearranged it again, using the contents and physical features of the manuscript itself and evidence from Thoreau's journal to create groupings that reflected Thoreau's stints of work. Next slide, please. Shanley identified seven time periods when Thoreau revised and enlarged the manuscript. His arrangement has been immensely helpful to those who want to understand in general how Thoreau worked on Walden. But the development of the book was actually very much more complex than Shanley's orderly structure suggests. Shanley knew, Shanley knew this, but had no alternative than the arrangement he provided. Thoreau moved leaves into and out of drafts in a fluid process that can't be revealed by static images presented in a fixed order. But the high-res digital images allow for much more flexibility in studying the Walden manuscript while protecting the fragile original leaves. For example, you can download images and order them to show arrangements that may have existed during the composition process. This can help create revision narratives for passages that occur in several drafts. You can also enlarge the images to read text too faint to be deciphered with the naked eye, like insertions in faint pencil. Next slide, please. Going through the 1,200 plus pages of HM 924, a page at a time, which you can do, you see different paper colors and sizes, words written in ink and in pencil and in ink over pencil and in pencil over ink. You see insertions and deletions, ink deliberately scratched off, ink swiped away by a wet finger, pages stuck onto other pages with sealing wax. I want to give you just a glimpse of the manuscript by showing one page from each draft and one page from the additional material group. I'll also show one page from HM 925, the proof sheets marked by both the printer and Thoreau. For each draft in the left, to the left of the image, I've given dates for the hypothesized composition stints and the number of images in the draft, and I've noted Sanborn's additions. These are magnified in each image, too, thanks to Paul applying the magnifier. I've pointed these out so that if you use the Walden manuscript in research or teaching, you'll be able to recognize them as not Thoreau's numbers. Here's the first page of A. You can't read it at this size, but in the upper right corner, Thoreau has added in ink. Walden, he squeezed it in. 
Walden or Life in the Woods by Henry Thoreau addressed to my townsmen. And to the left of that in pencil, he's added a couplet from a journal entry dated September 12, 1841. Where I have been, there was none seen. Next slide, please. Here's first page of B. You see a couple of Sanborn's page numbers in gray pencil. Next slide, please. First page of C is set up in recognizable title page format. Next slide. The first page of D. Sanborn numbered this page in blue pencil. I don't know whether there's any significance to the different pencil colors, and I don't care. I respect Sanborn's work as an abolitionist, but when it comes to the Thoreau manuscripts, he was a common vandal. First page of E, please, on, which is the next slide. And then first page of F, next slide, please. The first page of F is actually a page of Thoreau's manuscript journal for 1847 and 48. He tore many leaves out of that manuscript volume. Actually, he destroyed the volume. It doesn't survive as a volume anymore. To place those leaves with lectures and essays he was working on. This is a good example of Shanley's dated structure for the manuscript and the revision sequence for the material on a page of the manuscript being at odds. Next slide, please. First page of G, another recognizable title page. First page, oh, next slide, please. And this is a page of the additional material. Um, this is another page of Thoreau's manuscript journal for 47 and 48. It contains material Thoreau used in both his first book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, and in Walden, um, Sanborn notes the week. I don't know if you can see the expanded, the magnified version to the right. Sanborn picked up on that. And then the last slide for me. Thank you. Finally, the first page of the corrected proof, showing the title page on the left and the copyright information on the right. At the bottom of the sheet, there's a penciled note from Thoreau to the printer, almost invisible here and very hard to make out even when the sheet is enlarged, about adjusting the engraving of the cabin and about where to place the map of the pond, which was engraved separately late in June or early in July, 1854. So that's the manuscript plus the, uh, plus the proofs. Um, I guess we're now on to the breakout rooms. Yeah, thank Good. you, Beth. You're welcome. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do now is um, have you all in, in some breakout rooms um, look at some of these manuscript pages. Um, together with transcriptions that Beth has created for them. And um, talk among yourselves about what you're seeing and then bring that back to a discussion of the whole. Here are the questions that we would like you to, to, to um, ask yourselves and discuss together. What do you think seems to be the sequence of changes and what are some possible reasons for them for just say one or two things that strike you as interesting on the manuscript pages. Um, do these changes introduce any subtle changes in textual meaning to Walden? And then is there anything else about them that captures your attention? There's a link at the bottom of this slide to a Google Doc and the Google Doc has all the links you need to get to the manuscript images and transcriptions. It has everything that you need to get to um, the fluid text edition page that has paragraphs three and four. And it has instructions for how to um, set up the fluid text edition so that you are looking at paragraphs three and four in versions E and F and you're, you're able to compare them with Walden as it was published in 1854. So those are the, if you, if you stop for a moment and think about it, right? Um, two revisions, an E revision and F revision. He first wrote these paragraphs in version E and then modified them in version F. Three set of manuscript images for each. In each set of three, you're gonna see that he makes changes on the page itself but then if you compare what he wrote 
in the first three, the E version, and you could, with what he wrote in the second three, the F version, you can ask yourself, okay, what changed between versions as opposed to what changes do we see taking place on a given manuscript page? This really nicely illustrates the challenge of wrapping your head around the revisions to Walden. Every page may have lots of changes made to it right on that page. And then there are differences to the same stretch of text between one version, draft version and another draft version. And this is one reason why the fluid text is really helpful because you can pull up the paragraphs in three, in, sorry, in E and F right next to each other. And you can see both changes he's making in E and F independently within those. And you can compare them side by side and say, okay, what changed between E and F? It looks like a number of you are here, right? This is what you should be seeing. And again, it's got instructions for how to load it up in the fluid text. There. Um, that's that's nice. Hey, gang. Hey, Paul. <laughs> How's it going? Good. We're, um, I've already given up trying to transcribe uh, Thoreau. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but you no, should... it was really fun. It was really fun. But if I did that all day for the 20 minutes, I'd never get to what right? you asked us to do. So, um, yeah, we were just kind of talking about how an E it starts out with paragraph two and F there's a paragraph one, but we're figuring out it's, I'm figuring out it's because paragraph one is totally new in F he adds it. Um, it's not in, not in. Yeah, e. yeah. So um, I think Beth, Beth was going to start by um, speaking to some of the questions that people raised about physical characteristics of the manuscript, like ink and pencil and so on. Do you want to take it away, yeah. Beth? I'll go ahead with that. Um, breakout group one asked if there were any edits done by Sanborn besides the page numbers. I have not seen any others, but I haven't looked at every single one of the 1200 pages. I don't, Sanborn did that ordering in order to create a version of Walden that he published in 1909 called the Bibliophile Edition in which he included material that Thoreau had excluded from the 1854 edition. Um, this was Sanborn as kind of, I don't know, this, uh, uh, Sanborn as expanding the picture of Thoreau uh, and what Thoreau's work was by providing stuff himself. So I, I don't know, I can't tell you for sure whether Sanborn did anything else besides the page numbers. If he did, I'll be even madder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if let's see um I, breakout let me look at there was a question from breakout group four about pen and ink thorough um almost always used pen initially um in in things that he was writing in his in his journal in letters, of course, he used he used pen. Um, that was the the um, uh, expression, the indication of uh, doing serious work. I think, and in 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 the time and, and in his and in his in his mind, he used pencil to distinguish. I think the uh, the a level of revision. Um, sometimes it's possible to see that pencil is a tentative revision, and in many of those cases, he goes over what he's written in pencil in ink. That doesn't mean he always rejects the penciled um, revision that he's suggesting to himself, but you see both of those. That's part of the fluidity. That's part of... of being able to see the fluidity of his of his composition and revision in the manuscript, which you can't see in, in any other way. Um, he did, I have not seen any revision in this, these 1200 pages, although again, I haven't looked at them all, that um, permanently deleted parts of the manuscript. Now, when he scraped off ink, 
um, if you don't enlarge, you can't always see what he scraped off. So maybe that was semi-permanent deletion. There is, there are passages in his journal that have to do with the death of his brother, John, in 1842, that he did mark out so heavily that it's not possible to read them. Not a lot, but once in a while he does that. Again, I haven't seen it in the Walden manuscript. Um, light or careful revisions in the manuscript. Yes, he did want to preserve the revision process, I believe. And it was over so many years that, he, and he was able to go back and rearrange things. Yeah, I think he was trying to keep track of, uh, to keep present what he, what his thoughts were all along the way. Um, let's see. I guess that's, those are the those are the quick ones I can answer. So maybe we we would like to talk a little bit about um, one change that um, a couple of groups noted, which is the change um, from uh, witch-like to inhumane. And so uh, we've got breakout group four saying, what's going on with Thoreau equating Zilpa's life as witch-like to inhumane, especially given his, com his commitment to abolitionism? I think that's the right context in which to think about um, whatever his word choice here, Thoreau is an uh, ardent abolitionist, um, writing in this chapter about uh, former, uh, formerly enslaved people who had uh, lived in the Walden Woods, in, in the part of the Walden Woods where he is now, who are, who are no, lo no longer there, but who, like him, are, are, are people living on the margins, right, for, for very different reasons, but still he has that in common with them. Um, and um, breakout group three, let me just point out about what breakout group three said about this. Um, the Princeton version is not the first version, actually. That's the last one, right? So that's, that's yeah, yeah. when you're looking at that leftmost column, it's a little bit confusing in the view. That's Walden as it was finally published. So he first writes the passage, these paragraphs in E, and then he revises them in F. Yeah. And um, so, yes, so so the Princeton one is, is more compact but in lots of ways, um, <laughs> although sometimes more expansive about s certain things if over the course of the drafts he decided to expand on something. Right. So um, what, what do people think about that change? I've, I've heard witch like used a lot of times to explain like the Salem witch issues that as people got older, women were living longer, they were by themselves, they became more crone-like. So they tended to think of them as being odd and witch-like. And I, I don't know if he's somewhat influenced by that kind of mindset versus the abolition part, but um, I think he, his mind goes to that, her being alone and in the character, he kind of draws for her muttering and being older. But then I think he decides that there might be a bad or evil connotation to that. And that's not necessarily the point he's trying to make. He's trying to just show how her life was so hard. And this might be related to abolition and inhumane um, way she had to survive to exist. So that was, that was my thought on maybe what he might have been thinking of, but who knows? Kirk was looking at everything very algorithmically. <laughs> I wonder if whether he got down to the end of the paragraph and, you know, he wrote she's, she's, she's muttering to herself over her gurgling pot. Ye are all yes. bones, bones. That's kind of Macbethish, you know, that, the, and, and maybe he wanted to break that connection. I'm just thinking about um, how you have to think about both 
his attitudes um, with abolition, but also with gender, because um, I mean, to this day, you know, um, th there's just this issue with with black women being treated differently. Um, I just haven't. Well, I don't want to get too far off topic, but I think I think that that you know, there's a lot that when you think about how Walden as a whole is is dealing with gender and what gets edited um, out and how women are represented and not represented. So all through um, the concerns with um, black civil rights, women have been behind or left out and it feels like maybe his manuscript is, is I mean, maybe it's doing that too, to a certain extent, treating black women, um, I don't know, just a lot of the different stereotypes associated with them as opposed to the kind of manly ideals that fit with, um, you know, uh, notions of American citizenship. Um, branching off of that idea, there was a conversation in my group about um, speaking to what Caroline's saying about uh, how women in general are being portrayed kind of witch-like, especially in the two paragraphs that we were um, going through. There was um, Zilpha, who was initially described as witch-like, and then uh, Zenda, I think, was described as a black orb. So that he's using these very mystical terms to describe women, um, black women in particular. And one of the things that we were thinking about was the way that um, in trying to perhaps empathize with them, he's exoticizing them, which is um, just another point on what Caroline was saying uh, that a lot of black women deal with today. So, uh, you know, I think that it it's kind of, it struck us as modern readers to read that because it was kind of like there was, you know, and then going into the next paragraph about um, saying a man of color as if he were discolored uh, was kind of striking as well because it seemed like there was a, 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 a move to avoid colorblindness, but then at the same time, there's this exoticizing perspective that he has. So uh, we found that to be pretty striking. I think that's 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 really interesting the the gender difference and the and and the sort of nuanced understanding of how he can be at one and the same time um, empathizing with these people that he sees maybe some camaraderie with as other marginalized people, but doing it through this process of um, as you said, exoticizing them. Um, the, the gender discussion makes me think about the fact that um, in talking about Brister, the, the, um, the it's, I, I think it's not, it's not necessarily clear from the passage itself that the phrase um, man of color is used, correct me if I'm wrong about this, Beth or Dennis or, or someone else, um, on the epitaph, of the of the the Brister Freeman gravestone that he's looking at, that's where the phrase comes from. So it's it seems like he's sort of you know mocking that characterization of him as if he were discolored. And then he makes the interesting connect, connection between um, you know Scipio Brister. Um, I don't have the passage right in front of me right now. I've got so many windows open on my screen. But it, it said, you know, more like um, Scipio. And what's the Africanus? Th thank you, Scipio Africanus, who is this Roman general who defeated Hannibal. So, so he's. Um, it's a different kind. What's interesting is that maybe that's a another kind of exoticizing, but the exoticizing is definitely gendered. You know, the the, the you empathize through exoticizing this man by likening him to a general and it's very different with the women. I think this is, we, we, we need to wrap up the discussion. Beth, did you, you're nodding your head. Did you want to add anything? No, no, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm agreeing with the, the different, with the gendered um, 
uh, with Thoreau's gendered uh, perception of, of these people he's describing. I mean, the women are described very differently. They have cats. They, 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 <laughs> you know, they, 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 they cook over their pots. They're hospitable. Fend is the hospitable wife. Yeah. The men are um, involved in agriculture. They're involved in, well, they're not involved in war, but they're buried next to war heroes. They're not war heroes. They're buried next to British grenadiers, excluded. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yes. And um, as we as we wrap up, since a lot of what we've been, we've been talking about is not necessarily things he changed, but just his language generally for describing these people, the the British Grenadiers reference is something that he does decide to insert. And um, Rebecca, I don't know if that's something that you and your students talked about, or should we save any yeah, more discussion about that to your, your assignment? Yeah. We definitely talked about that, about um, that, that that's inserted as an afterthought. And also they were, they were very interested in what it meant that this is the place where, where he, this man was buried, that he was buried not only with the British, but with the British dead from this, this historic battle that is so important to um, Concord's identity. And that that really is a, a way of ostracizing him in death as he would, he would geographically ostracize in life. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think these, um, these are a couple of good examples of how um, looking at the revisions prompts you to ask yourself, what was, what was, what was he thinking? You know, um, is this addition, is the substitution of one word for another a change in his way of understanding somebody he's writing about? Is his addition of words that weren't there before uh, uh, an insight about a connection between the, the, the Grenadiers and himself and these other marginalized folks. And, and that's a large, that's, that's all interpretive, right? That's all um, not simply a matter of describing what's in a manuscript, but trying to draw conclusions from what you find there. And a lot of the joy that, that this group has gotten out of pondering Thoreau's revisions has been on the interpretive side. And one of the challenges we've discussed a lot is how do you actually get that interpretive dimension into your encoding so that your encoding isn't simply a description, oh, well, this is, this is what you see on the manuscript, but here's what it might mean. In the same way we do when we close read finished published texts with an aim to understand their meaning. So, I hope this gives you lots of lot, lot, lots more to think about. We have to move on in order to get through the rest of what we what we have in store for you before we run out of time. So I'm going to go back to sharing the slides and queue up. Nick and Elisa to talk about encoding with XML and TEI. And so are you all seeing the slides I'm again? I'm seeing discussion questions. OK, good. So that just means hopefully that I just need to move ahead to text scholarship and text encoding. Right. So I put together a, just a very minimal small slide deck here to help introduce the um, text encoding and some of the work we're doing. And right, I'm Elisa Bichero Bondar, um, and I'm part of the text encoding wing of the project. Um, and one of the ways I'd like to talk about text encoding is to try to demystify it. It isn't um, necessarily as high tech as we'd like to think that we've been doing text encoding um, probably throughout human civilization. It's simply um, thinking of it as markup is probably a more helpful way of looking at it. As we were looking at Sanborn's scribblings on the page, that horrible vandal uh, that he was, we could call it vandalism or we could call it markup. Um, and the idea that we have a shared practice of signs and symbols that go with transmitting and sharing texts is what I'm calling here the manual heritage of digital text encoding. Next slide, please. 
So um, markup can be more, from less to more explicit when we're sort of hand marking things with carrots and raised dots. Maybe those are sort of symbolic and we all understand how to read a set of shared symbols. I chose to show on the right here one of Beth Witherall's amazing um, renditions in word of uh, what's happening, the events happening on uh, on a single verso side of um, a, a page image here. And I'm not going to try to read it all, but as you look at it, your ability to decipher those marks is simply a, a human readable language of markup. It's also, of course, being shared in a digital way because Beth made this using a word processor. There, there are some amazing things that we can do to communicate with each other to make it easier to read um, what's going on on um, one of Thoreau's notebook pages. Um, the way we share with each other has a lot to do with our shared needs to curate these objects um, in a way. I mean, I think what we're seeing here is a standard way of sharing a kind of what we call genetic editing. Um, and uh, we need to do that in order to be able to read this work or make it easier for others to read it. Um, and when we do that, we've made a kind of collective community decision that we need to share these documents. We're not going to leave them alone we need to share them with others. And that leads us into the world of text encoding. So next slide. Yeah, so I wanted to go from Beth's markup to the text encoding initiative markup. And those are my initials here. Um, I, I was involved in, in trying to figure out the text coding base. And what I wanted to say about this is you can probably figure out what's going on here in this coded view where we're trying we're using angle bracketed tags in a regular syntax the difference here is that this is meant to be read by both humans and machines um and you can see me communicating with the project team in that thing in green which is called a comment um but there are events going on here there's a a, a hand shift a shift to a different writing utensil there's another one that's going to ink and yeah there's um this is simply yet another way of markup. And that's why it's called extensible markup language, the basis for the text encoding language that we're using on this project. So next slide. Right, so um, probably many of you have heard about the Text Encoding Initiative or the TEI. We thought it was probably wise to give um, an introduction to it for anyone who is new. Um, but this has been around for a rather long time, since 1987, which was a moment that it was at was at the verge uh, when we were moving. It was kind of a, it, um, we were starting to use personal computers. Um, this community was formed to deal with a problem of um, emerging different ways of representing electronic, well, tra transmitting um, and sharing electronic texts with different companies forming. Um, every different company was starting to come up with its own um, system of sharing text electronically. And this initiative was formed to say, wait a minute, we don't need our cultural heritage documents to be subject to the compet capitalist competition, if you will. So um, the idea here was to form a shared standard, um, a set of guidelines um, shared by a community um, that that would basically come up with standards for um, sharing texts in electronic format. And I think we can go on to the next slide here. Yeah, so my point with this, this little series of slides is that the whole point of working with the TEI is working with a shared community language. Um, it's been about um, trying to come up with a reasonably stable code base. There have been five major releases of the TEI as a, as a language um, of a language that's communicated inside the, the angle bracketed code. Um, there have been five major versions of that since 19, well, the mid 1990s, um, which is actually not very many. Um, the TEI has changed over the years, but all, all along there's been a strong attention to um, having a set of guidelines that people can read and share. Um, it's also a, a community at the TEI as a consortium that has its own conference. Um, but 
Even so, I, I, one of the problems with the TEI that people regularly identify is that not everybody uses it the same way. Um, and indeed, every project needs to customize it in its own way. And what tends to happen is that we form communities of practice that interpret the TEI guidelines for themselves to, to try to interpret them in a way that will communicate and share texts um, Within, within a particular group. And that provides a really nice way of introducing the way we can work with TEI in the classroom, that the classroom provides um, a shared community um, in which, well, our, our students need to be able to use these tags in a way that's intelligible to one another. The challenge, of course, is that you've got them for 15 weeks or less, um, and you've got them uh, with a limited time frame. But even so, working with the TEI is about making decisions together, and it's about promoting deep reading experimenting, discussion, um, researching of the TEI guidelines as well as of the subject matter, and all along revisiting what it is you want to, to, to learn about and share with your texts. And I think that's probably enough for me. What do you think, Paul? That sounds great. Thank you so much, Elisa. That was really helpful. Um, a great, concise introduction to what the TEI is all about and the difference between machine readable and human readable encoding. So um, we're gonna move on now to uh, Rebecca Nesbet, who's gonna talk about teaching these skills to her students in a capstone class at University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, using the paragraphs from chapter 14 of Walden that we've been talking about. I'll hand it over to Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, if we could go to the first slide of that, then thank you. Okay, great. Um, thanks. So uh, I'm going to talk about the experiment that um, I've been conducting with my class this year. It's the second year that we've worked um, together with the Digital Thorough Project. Um, but the first year in which students have been um, transcribing passages from uh, the, the chapter that you're, you're looking at, um, at uh, today in our workshop, uh, former inhabitants um, and winter visitors. Um, so uh, these students are in a 400 level uh, capstone course. Um, so they are the most advanced uh, students that we have and they're all um, English majors. Uh, and the learning objectives of this course is a course about literary citizenship. So they're learning about different ways to um, to conduct original research, to engage in collaborative public scholarship, which is what we're doing with, um, with the digital thorough, um, and uh, the, di the different kinds of literary communities, including, of course, um, the TEI community. Um, so, uh, and we spend about half the class on, on thorough and half the class on, on a different um, uh, 1840s, 1850s uh, figure, um, Mary Seacole. So, uh, so the objectives for the Walden transcription project that we did um, this semester, transcription of pass in, in the TI um, of passages from um, the, the various drafts uh, that contributed to uh, former inhabitants and winter visitors, um, the learning objectives um, were to learn how to transcribe literary manuscripts from holograph sources, so from reading the cursive, which uh, disturbingly is, is a new thing to some of these students. I, I now have the first generation of students who didn't learn cursive at school um, doing this, um, to gaining and then applying a basic knowledge of XML uh, encoding in accordance with the TI guidelines, um, and learning how to autonomously search the TI guidelines on the website, whether um, in the HTML or PDF versions, um, for uh, the basic uh, building blocks of, of, um, uh, of our work, elements, attributes, um, and uh, values, uh, either finding them or making them up. Um, and they need to, to learn to deliberately make critical and creative choices. And I think that's a very Thoreauian thing, that just as it's important to learn to live deliberately, it's important to learn to critique deliberately and to edit deliberately um, so that, you know, not just do the thing that's easier that you find in the TI guidelines first, but actually make a choice. Um, 
And uh, so to use those elements, attributes, and values to create accurate, clear, illuminating markup of um, our little digital edition of these, these passages, and then to pass that on to the, the digital Thoreau team so that the team can see both um, so, some detail of what, what, uh, you know, what kind of standards we might want to have for the overall encoding of uh, manuscript uh, 924, and also um, the uses that uh, transcription of that manuscript uh, can be put to in teaching. Um, and in, in creating this trans, the, these transcriptions, uh, they aim to tell the story of a literary work's genesis and to recognize the many other possible stories that might arise from the same documentary evidence. So just as you all got into breakout groups and you found um, some overlapping stories about the performance event of Thoreau's uh, writing and revising these pages, um, there, there were some overlaps, but there are also some unique stories that came out of that. Um, and uh, they also have to learn to explain these achievements with accuracy and confidence. So saying, I learned TI and this is what I did with it. Um, and that's important, um, not because employers necessarily want XML or TI, but because they want adaptability and they want students, people who don't you know, fear technology. Um, and also to develop confidence and flexibility in experimenting with unfamiliar digital tools, languages and methods and getting to the point um, where they can say in their professional lives, I can figure out how to do that. And I think that's not only a kind of neoliberal employment-based objective, that is a citizenship objective. If you are comfortable with unfamiliar situations, if you're willing to listen and to learn, then you're going to become a better citizen, both of the Republic of Letters and of other kinds of republics. Um, so, uh, so those were, were the objectives for the project. And because uh, the pandemic had set in, um, uh, you know, uh, before we began classes in early September, um, I designed a lot of stuff uh, online. The course went completely online synchronous, so we're still meeting in person on Zoom, um, but we, uh, we've done a lot of flipped work outside of the classroom that normally would be done in the computer lab um, the way I've taught this before. Um, so they, uh, they had a, uh, um, the transcription assignment where they create in um, the XML file using Oxygen um, within the 30 day test period that Oxygen allows. So nobody actually has to pay for Oxygen if you don't have an institutional subscription. Um, and then they upload a draft and then I give them commentary on that draft and feedback. And um, then they have a week to revise the draft and um, and uh, put it put it back together. Um, and that I, I think is about modeling the experience of real researchers and real and professional writers where you submit something and you get, it goes through peer review, it goes through editorial review, you, uh, you get feedback and um, then you have a certain period of time in which you have to give it back showing that you've thought through that feedback and you've made some changes. Um, so they all went through that process just in time for their final pieces of work to be uploaded to, um, to the digital Thoreau site so that you can see um, what they've done here. Um, before uh, we started on that, of course, we read plenty of Thoreau. We read extracts from Walden, including um, uh, Economy, a few other chapters, and Former Inhabitants and Winter Visitors. And also um, to get into, into you know, why Thoreau should, part of why Thoreau should matter to us, we read Civil Disobedience and we applied it to, to contemporary social issues. And we also read this book, um, so Diary of a Young Naturalist by um, Dara McAnulty, who is a 16 year old uh, um, author from, uh, from Northern Ireland. And uh, this book was published in, in May, um, 2020, and he, write, he writes um, a diary that follows the seasons that is very self-consciously like Walden about his exploration of uh, the wilderness, mostly uh, very in or very close to urban settings. He grew up in Belfast, um, uh, you know, places you wouldn't really expect to find nature, and then eventually he becomes a kind of climate activist. Um, so he joins a group of high school climate activists that participated in a major demonstration um, in, in Dublin uh, in 2019. Um, and, and the book just actually won um, the major British award for nature writing. And that makes him the youngest person in recent memory to have um, won 
uh, any kind of major British book prize. And I, I think it's an honor to Thoreau that he uses the phrase civil disobedience and um, in, his, uh, in his, his nature writing, um, he really does try to model himself, I think, um, upon Thoreau. So we read that, they went outside into whatever nature they could find during the pandemic. Normally we'd go to the Arboretum, but it wasn't, it wasn't really possible to do that together. Um, and they, they did some naturalist writing as well. And then when we went to look at Thoreau's manuscripts, we could relate um, his experience um, to their experience of doing this kind of writing and then revising it. Um, so what I'm going to show you next is uh, how they, having uh, uh, got this kind of crash course in Thoreau's writing and ideas and very contemporary influence, um, they applied uh, that information to uh, creating the transcription. So I made them a, a, a um, online asynchronous um, non-video course on Canvas to learn TEI. So um, it was like a series of ungraded quizzes and they could do it as many times as they wanted. And most of them on average, they got 94% of it correct on the first try. Um, so that, that seemed to work except for, you know, the one consistent no-show student because you always have um, one of those. And then we turned to, um, then we turned to the, the passages from former inhabitants and winter visitors that you've been looking at as well as a few others. So if we could move on to the next slide then, please. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so they, uh, uh, one moment, sorry. Um, uh, hang on. All right. Um, so this is an example of just a page from that, you know, workshop um, slash quiz. Uh, so I included screenshots from Oxygen identifying um, basically the grammar of, of XML and they had some, some, some work on that. And also um, familiarizing them with what the TEI is as a project, um, a, a community and a set of guidelines that they, uh, that they would be joining this project in this community just by the act of learning the TEI and creating um, a digital edition in it. Um, and also that the guidelines are guidelines, that they're meant uh, to, to be adaptable and they're meant to encourage creativity and experimentation. And there's images here from, of Jeffrey Rush and Kira Knightley in the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie because a line that I love from that movie because I think it explains uh, what the TEI aims to do very well is the code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules, um, Jeffrey Rush, the character says. And that's in, of course, you know, in the interests of creativity and, um, and adaptability. Um, next slide. So, uh, so, so they, uh, um, you know, they, what they're seeing within the quiz is, is exactly from oxygen. There would be simple um, questions like, which of the tags above are non-self-closing? Um, next slide. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I signed each of them a passage um, from former inhabitants and winter visitors. And they, uh, they were told to look at the facsimile to put in the metadata from the, the Huntington's page on, page on that page um, into their, uh, their headers and then to transcribe and mark up um, the text itself. And um, several of them are assigned um, the, uh, the same passage because we wanted to get together at the end and say, all right, well, how have we all done it differently? Like the last reflection they've done um, on this project is comparing their work with somebody else's, uh, you know, and saying, you know, what are the similarities and the differences and where are you being unique and creative here? Um, so, uh, overall, it went really well. Like they got, they mostly got the handwriting in pandemic conditions on whatever computers they had that were not the fancy ones in my lab, and um, uh, you know, and there, there was, there, and and they're tenacious about it. Like there was a lot of, I said, okay, if you've got that one passage, that's good. And there are students who said, no, I'm going to do the whole page, or I'm, I'm going to keep going. I want to do another revision of this. I'm like, okay, that's wonderful. You people are amazing, and. Um, there is a fair amount of tag abuse, um, particularly using highlight to indicate um, uh, figurations of the text that uh, are not a form of typeface. Um, but 
Um, I gave them a few tags to start with. I'm like, you absolutely have to use these like addition and deletion if you have those things. And here are some others that will be useful, like creating extra divs, um, gaps, uh, page numbering, and so on. Um, and there was some significant variation in what they eventually achieved with this. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks. Um, so like this is, is one of one student, um, Danny Gottfried, um, I, who uh, um, noted the gray pencil. I did tell them it was Sanborn later, but I didn't want them to have too much information. So we started out with just whatever physical features you see. Um, that's what you encode. Um, and uh, so something that, that I've, I've noticed about her work here um, is there's a series of deletions and additions where she's marked um, that it is gray pencil, you know, that that's an important um, characteristic of it, and that she's really gone through and just followed the same feature throughout the page, ignoring other features, which is a perfectly good way of doing it, of establishing that pattern. And then another student, um, Caitlin Pichette, next slide, please. Um, so uh, she did something slightly different here, where she, there's this cryptic other hand um, for probably Sanborn here, um, the, the, the page number in gray pencil. Um, and uh, so uh, she's also uh, marked uh, that uh, Thoreau, um, that when it shifts back, it shifts to Thoreau's writing um, as author. Um, so there's the author and there's this like other hand which is invading the author's work. Which I, so there's, there's a lot of drama, I think, in her choice of tags. Um, uh, next, uh, next slide, please. And I made them also write um, a back section, um, uh, uh, which had, which is used, um, you know, in our project for critical commentary. So they would have a critical commentary on their transcription that they write after they finish the transcription and that it's saved with it. And I learned a lot from the critical commentaries, both about their tracing of Thoreau's um, uh, performance of, of you know, how he, he, uh, he completes these revisions, um, and also what they were learning about the TEI and about themselves as, meta, as members of this, new, of this TEI community. Um, so I'm gonna just read some of that in their own words um, to finish up. Uh, so uh, Amelia Boylan Noor is one of our student editors and she wrote um, uh, the, the bottom paragraph here. Uh, uh, he also wrote in pencil. This is how I was able to tell that he came back and added to his original work. Also taking note of the points in which he dipped his ink pen but continued writing the sentence tells me that he wrote this page in one sitting and in, in um, her transcription, she used the pointer tag to um, indicate every time he dips the pen and, and gets fresh ink. Um, so uh, there was a point in the middle where he wrote English that had a dark splotch at the beginning of him writing it. This was not a point where he would have needed to re-dip, and the ink before and after it was the same consistency. This told me that Thoreau paused. Whether he had a change in thought, hesitated about his word choice, or was distracted by an outside force like the sound of a bird speaking outside of his door is unknown. I love how that just turns into poetry, actually quite Thoreauian poetry. It looks as though he continued writing without actually lifting the pen, hence the heavily darkened splotch that he was reconsidering his word choice. Finally, the pointer points were all spaces that Thoreau needed to dip his pen to continue writing. This shows readers of his original work that he wrote this page in one sitting. The pencil he came in with later tells him that he was editing his previous work. Um, so, uh, so I think you know that that is a wonderful archaeology of that text. And of course, you know because we were the the, the text that we're looking at is the pieces about um, the former inhabitants, the African American ancestors who, um, who who lived in this space prior to Thoreau being there. Um, Thoreau is conducting archaeology of their space, and we are conducting archaeology of his space. Next slide. Please. So, um, okay. And um, I, uh, so, I mean, I, I have learned a lot both from the tags and, uh, and the commentary here. Um, our next editor, Heather Rupiper, wrote, before this project, I wasn't even aware of XML as a coding language. 
I did have prior experience with using HTML for website design and having that knowledge was definitely helpful. I think without um, the HT, um, I think without the HTML experience, I would have really struggled with figuring out how to properly mesh tags. There is some overlap between the two languages, which I mostly found useful. Tags like body and paragraph are pretty much the same um, in both languages. And um, so she she uh, she writes. It's in, encouraging to see, you know, through tracing the, the revisions um, that. Uh, um, well, actually, I'm going to back up to because something we've already talked about. This addition is really interesting to me because it says a lot about Bristol Freeman's status and treatment while he was alive. Um, through his placement and death, buried to the side of a cemetery near enemy soldiers. Um, it's also interesting to see the additions and deletions from a writer's perspective. It's encouraging to see physical evidence that lauded writers whose work has survived generations don't just sit down and pour out flawless prose right from the start. And she added, I learned from that I enjoy doing this. And she's actually interested in continuing to learn more about uh, TI, which is wonderful. Um, and I'm going to end with this one by uh, Kristen Schlorf, also commentary. Uh, this is one really I had never considered before and I found fascinating. I took a class learning American Sign Language in high school. If you know the context in which something is put, your brain tries to automatically fill in any blanks you have. For example, when I would take a test in my ASL class, my teacher would fingerspell 10 words. The first word was always the category, and the other nine words related to that first word. So if the first word was Disney and the last word started with M-O-U, my mind would fill it in with the word mouse. Using Thoreau's finished work was similar to that. I knew what Thoreau ultimately wanted to say, so from the, the, the fluid text Walden, so I was able to figure out what he did say in the earlier version of the manuscript. Um, so, uh, and I had really never thought about how people learn ASL, because I don't know ASL, in comparison to um, how they learn familiarity with um, a writer's handwriting. And um, so I, I really thank this student and the TI community for making my learning that possible. Thanks. I also want to thank Beth yep. for helping me identify the passages that we used in the first place. So thank you. So um, that, that was great, Rebecca. Thank you so much for yeah. um, share, sharing that that work. Um, the the re really creative um, pedagogy and really creative work by the students too. Um, we are we're over our time. Um, we did want to give you a chance to ask any final questions that you might have, um, realizing though that you may be eager to go since uh, we build this at 7 to 8.30 and it's, it's, it's past 8.30. But um, if anybody does want to ask a quick question or make a final comment, um, please unmute yourself and uh, go right ahead. My question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Serenity. I was just going to say, my question is um, this seems like a wonderful learning tool. Um, we've seen a lot of the ways in which the students are being interpretive of the text and learning. Um, and so it's really great for a pedagogical purpose. I'm wondering what happens to these files after the students have done a hot dog uh, <laughs> style <laughs> cross out that you said in the chat. Um, or other things, you know, what ha what happens to these files? Do they do they go somewhere on the project to be used, or are they purely pedagogical? Well, at this point, um, they're purely pedagogical. So what I have well, not mostly about ninety percent. So what I told the students is, I will be sharing your work with the Digital Thoreau team, and this is because there are aspects of our project, both how how we plan to represent these manuscript pages as publication and how we plan to, um, to offer them as a teaching tool. Um, and we, we're going to be able to learn about how to do both of those things from your work. But that what we're doing is an experiment and it is not going to be transformed into HTML and published. Yeah, Later, you know, we might go on to, to actually transcribe stuff that gets published. Um, what I, one thing I like about your question 
serenity is that it really goes to the heart of what we have seen ourselves doing in this project in in thinking both about um, what are the opportunities that the manuscript presents for a completely new encoding of Thoreau's revision process and how can um, the manuscript function as a teaching tool um, both for for students and teachers who wanted to deal with digital scholarly editing, TEI encoding, and so on, and um, for those who were just interested in manuscripts, and for those who were just interested in Thoreau or American literature, and and see an opportunity to see it through a different lens by being able to access the manuscript. So the um, the website that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, where we're creating these modules. It's published out of a GitHub repository. Um, we're hoping that um, that repository can also be a place to collect assignments and other pedagogical materials um, that, that come from this group, but, but uh, that are contributed by others as well. Um, and, um, and that the, the actual modules could uh, draw on some of that material to in, uh, present examples of, of uh, assignments that, um, that, that students could do together to learn TEI or to think about, again, about manuscripts or just about Thoreau and Walden. So um, hopefully, um, and this, you know, there's always a, a really important question here that I, that I hear Rebecca getting at um, uh, about um, permission and uh, respect for students and their their work, um, and and uh, about you know uh, for their willingness to share or not, and um, uh, but I you know everything that uh, Lisa said about the importance of community to um, developing a standard like TEI and to projects like this reflected also in the fact that we're working on this as a group and that this is such a common model in digital humanities. Um, so that emphasis on community suggests to me that um, a really valuable aim is to share as much of this work as possible openly, both the assignments that people develop and to the extent students are comfortable, the work that they have produced. Um, it's, you know, even, even obviously if the encoding students produce are not accurate, the, the evidence that their work shows of the intellectual value of just doing the work um, is, is, I think, really important. Other questions or comments? I think it, it just occurred to me that one of the things you do when you have students do markup is they're writing. It's an act of writing. Um, and that's worth thinking about. It, it's the need to try to demystify it when they apply tags, they're writing. So, yeah. Absolutely. It's, as, it's critical and creative writing. Well, um, I want to thank all of you who have um, joined us tonight. Um, and uh, thank you for your, for your thoughts, your contributions. Great discussion about paragraphs three and four of former inhabitants. Um, thank you again to all the members of the group for, um, for all their work and um, for all that they've shared um, tonight and through this whole project. And um, our last session is this same time next Thursday where we have uh, invited um, those who are interested, who are doing um, projects of their own, pedagogical projects of their own that involve uh, encoding or editing of any kind in the undergraduate classroom to give quick talks, um, six to 10 minutes about the work that they've been doing. So there'll be a new Zoom link for that. There'll be some more information to watch for before next Thursday. Um, thank you all again. And uh, we look forward to, to carrying on this conversation. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.